Hello, my name is Horkon and welcome back to my channel, all you fabulous fighting fantasy aficionados, uh, for yet another episode of playing a fighting fantasy. And this time we are going into Battle Blade Warrior for the third time. Uh, now, if you remember the previous time, which I will presume that you know about well, when you get to this point, um, I started from a point where I go into what is a kind of a dungeon area, as one might call it in the genre, an underground crawl. You have your junctions, you have your left and right, and choosing which room to go to. And in this story, I'll just do a quick recap. You're a prince of the realm. You have been invaded by lizard men. You have escaped the blockade of your city, the siege of your city, in order to find two divine artifacts that together make an invincible weapon, um, uh, which is known as the it's known as the arms and the eyes of Telak. Telak is your god of war, and you have been tasked pretty much by the god himself to go and get these so you can get rid of the lizard man scourge. That is the long and the short of it. You have traveled north to find a place where are um, a few mountains. Between the mountains there's a ravine and there's a city that has toppled into it. Inside this city, according to an old man that you meet there, you will find the arms and the eyes of Tilak. He tells you that he doesn't know what form the eyes of Tilak takes. Um, in our previous playthrough we realized, of course, as uh, I expected, that the eyes would be some kind of gem. But the big puzzle of this particular part of the book is to find out which gem. There are four different ones that can be picked up in these dungeons. Uh, last time I only found one. I found rubies. There is also diamond, jet, and one more thing, which I can't recall right now. Hang on. Um, emerald. is emerald as well. So it's one of those things will be the gem that you need in order to proceed. It is also quite possible that you might be able to pick up more than one gem on a playthrough of this particular section of the book. And in which case, um, one has to make a choice uh, um, where I ended it last time, which gem you think is the correct one. There might be some clues and hints to which one is correct that I may have missed because obviously uh, a really long time also passed from the first time I played this book until the second time. Not so much from the second to the third time, as you can tell because uh, my bookshelf looks very similar to last time. Um, I keep moving things around in my bookshelf. Anyway, um, I'm going to continue where I go back to the place where you go into the dungeons and I'll take it from there. So I'll just change my view to my desk so I don't need the mouse here. That is neither here nor there. Um, got my supplies, got my book, uh, map, character sheet which I'm hardly using now and dice which I'm also hardly using now. Uh, I've realized long since that my main enjoyment of these books is to find the correct path through. I'm also enjoying the mapping, I'm enjoying all these little things. Whereas the random element, the dice rolling, is not that enjoyable because it's a random element. You can't control it. You're supposed to have choices that control your destiny. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, in that spirit, one should actually leave the dice off um, and say whenever there are dice to be rolled, you sort of choose uh, what outcome you might wish. Sometimes I actually wish for a dice roll to fail because it's time to uh, take a little break from playing the game until next time. Right, so I'm going to go back to paragraph 48 um, uh, again. <clears throat> uh, Laska, which is the, um, that's the old man that uh, just helped you um, to find the way to this particular location and told you about the arms and the eyes of uh, Telak. He, he finds all kinds of equipment for you. Uh, oh, hang on. Am I in focus? Uh, the eternal question. Uh, let's see if my remote control is working. It looks like I am in focus. Good. Uh, last car finds all kinds of equipment for you. Choose what you do not already have from the following list and write it on your adventure sheet. I'm not going to write it down. I'll just refer back to this paragraph should it become necessary. 
Um, Yulao Laskar to lead you back to the ravine. Rather than climbing to the edge, though, he takes you by a wide sloping path down the side of the, of the huge cut. The going is hard, and before long the track is so steep and rocky that you must rope yourselves together. Eventually, you reach the base of the ravine and stand looking out across the ruined city with its once beautiful buildings now lying at strange angles, twisted and cracked by their fall. Laskar leads you through the city, bringing you to where a huge depression leads down into the earth. The roof of a covered courtyard has fallen in, and several dark and forbidding passages lead off it. Laskar point, points one out. That one leads down to another courtyard from where you will find passages leading to the crypts, the royal palace and chief temple. I have not been further than the courtyard. You embrace the old man and he departs to climb up to the temple on the north side of the ravine and await your successful emergence from the underground complex. Would it descend into the darkness or pause a while? So this time I'm going to do pause a while because that is gives you actually a little clue for later. As you wait, plucking up the courage to enter the darkness, you are horrified to see Laskar reach the far side of the ruins and be surrounded by lizard men. The creatures march away with a hermit, and another band has been dispatched in your direction. This is all the incentive you need to duck down into the hole and begin your journey through the darkness. 2289. So, that's information that actually becomes important later on. Immediately, it is very cool and very dark. You light your lantern and peer about you. The passage is decorated with rows of statues, now toppled and smashed. The floor beneath your feet may once have been a flight of steps, worn smooth to a shallow slope, which climbs down into another covered courtyard. From here lead off two passages, both dark and uninviting. Would it take the one to the right or to the left? Now, last time I went left almost every single time I had a chance, so this time I should be going right. Right? The path curves gently down between rows of ancient statues before opening out into a large antechamber littered with debris. Now, you may have noticed last time I said debris, but I just realized that I'm not. I'm, I'm, it's one of those words that, um, as a foreign speaker of, of English, and sometimes natives do this as well, um, it can be pronounced with a stress on the first or the last syllable, but um, if you don't use the word very often, sometimes you end up doing one and other times the other. I do believe that the debris pronunciation is chiefly American, and the debris is the chiefly British pronunciation, and um, usually when I have a choice between those two, I normally go for the one that is chiefly British, if I have a choice, and of course, in my case, not being a native speaker, it's one of those things that I have to decide for myself as a stylistic choice, um, and then try to be consistent, because I have no real linguistic influence from childhood that directs me one way or the other. Um, other words that are sometimes have been known to pronounce differently, um, either and either, for instance. Sometimes it just feels right to see either rather than either, but um, yeah. Anyway, debris. I'm going to go with debris as, as long as I can. Anyway, um, when I think about it, debris, yeah. Opposite are a pair of solid double doors. Of course, in poetry, uh, another aside now, of course, my usual aside. In poetry, of course, um, it would be the rhythm of the line that decides whether it's debris or debris. Um, so, of course, that's uh, it's nice to have these words that are um, uh, ambiguous when it comes to the stress. Um, and this seemed, uh, when you read, if you read older poetry, it seems that some words used to be a little bit more flexible when it comes to stress. And also many words have changed where the primary stress on the word is. Uh, there's, for instance, a line in, um, in Hamlet where Polonius says character rather than character. Um, and usually because of, uh, I do believe there's um, 
a slightly different meaning to the one we usually associate with the word as well. Uh, it is quite common for actors performing this line to actually shift the stress to, say, character. Although, uh, I would say generally that when people perform Shakespeare, um, it's each actor usually decides how they want to do it, whether they want to use the poetic um, stress pattern of the lines, or if they want to use a modern uh, diction of the lines, uh, and they're thereby, uh, of course, in many cases, communicating perhaps better the meaning of the line, um, and also breaking up that potential monotony of rhythm that might exist in the original iambic pentameter. And of course, there are those that also uh, subscribe to using the line as written or intended uh, rhythmically by Shakespeare, which can get a little bit boring, potentially, if you do it too much. Um, Shakespeare himself, of course, he did actually break up the rhythm of his lines a little bit, not as much as some people think. Um, and uh, but I, I quite like how it has in in modern productions i would say so sort of 1950s onwards something like that um a tendency for the producers and directors to seem to leave it up to the actors themselves how they want to communicate their lines to a large extent um they make them understand their characters their motivations etc etc and then it's often the actor that has sort of the final say in how they want to deliver a line in an attempt to convey what the character is feeling, thinking, and how that benefits their motivations. And of course, in order to communicate all those things to the audience. So um, sometimes I find it a little bit grating still when actors it feels like they don't actually understand the original rhythm of Shakespeare, um, that it doesn't, that their choice doesn't actually come from an informed place uh, of understanding it. And, uh, and this has become quite apparent to me when I've been reading Shakespeare, because when you look at annotations that mention rhythm, uh, many of the annotators don't actually understand the rhythm of Shakespeare. So, uh, well, the intended rhythm, I should say. Although it is quite clear to me since I write poetry myself. Anyway, that's another big aside for you. Uh, I'm going to go back now to the book. Uh, there will be more asides probably, and uh, and it, it's one of those things that will fill in the time a little bit. And and uh, and also, as you know, it makes uh, this uh, reading and playing of a game book a more social uh, event, a social <laughs> um, activity for me because it feels like I'm communicating with someone when I'm doing this, and it's not just like I'm talking to myself. No, no, I don't need to do that. Um, right, not that there's anything wrong with that, by the way. Some people, uh, another aside, some people say that uh, talking to yourself is a sign of insanity, but that's not true, actually. I think talking to yourself is a really good thing to do. Um, for many, it's a way to structure your thoughts, and your words, and trying to um, find a way to express something particular, um, to understand something, to process something that needs processing, whether it's it's anger or grief or or something less important, um, something you just read about, heard about, and you sort of you have your thoughts churning about it, and then you talk about it loudly to yourself, and it makes uh, the information stick better and also it makes you understand it better. So I don't see anything wrong with people doing that. Um, I have several um, friends, well not several, I have some friends who do it, I have my wife does it. Um, it's normal. Yeah. Anyway, back to the book. Right, so, um, littered with debris. Opposite are a pair of solid double doors. You cross to them and listen carefully, but hear nothing. Gingerly, you push them open and peer into the darkness. The next chamber is similar to the last, but larger and in better condition. In each corner stands a life-size statue of a warrior, with two more flanking the doors at the far end of the room. You pick your way across the room and almost jump out of your skin, in fright as the two door guardians cross spears to bar your way. The one to the right is missing most of its head, and the other has lost its left arm, but both are animated by evil. How do you know? How do you know they're animated by evil? Maybe they're animated by good, trying to keep evil out. There's no way for you to know, actually. That's an assumption that shouldn't be made. 
and are quite capable of taking you on. The head on the floor by the white warrior's feet booms out, None shall enter here. None shall enter here. Just like in old heroic saga, you think to yourself, hefting your sword. The guardians attack together, and they're not very strong. Skill 6, stamina 4, skill 5, stamina 5. I'm not going to roll that combat. I would have won it quite easily anyway. And if you defeat both of them, turn to 269. Okay. And last time I kept forgetting to actually make a note of battles, uh, but of course I've started ignoring them. But it might be a nice way to sort of um, indicate on my map where there are monsters. Here, there be dragons, for instance. Um, okay, 269. The statues are finally shattered and smashed, but at quite a high cost, your sword, which is notched and blunted, reduce your attack strength by one. Mm. Okay, so ATK minus one. You listen at the door and hear creaking, like a door blowing in the wind. You listen again, but the noise has stopped. Gripping your sword, you push open the door, turn to 153. Okay, I'm going to move that over on the side here, since there's only one option. I don't, don't know how much space I need in the middle here for my map. The door opens to reveal a vast hall, its far end shadowy in your flickering lantern light. You can just make out a large pair of double doors set in the far wall, and a pair of tattered curtains covering two small alcoves on the right wall. More importantly though, you can also make out the huge grey slug-like creature which is chomping at one of the curtains. What will you do? Attack the creature, slip round the room's left wall, slip round the room's right wall. So, we got three options. Something like that on my map. So attack three seven five. Uh, left one two four and right one three seven. Right left and uh, attack. I'm gonna try attacking the creature. The giant slug sees you and starts to lumber across the rubble towards you. It is a truly repulsive creature, dripping slime and spittle from its mouth as it ripples along. As it is a very slow-moving creature, you may have time to lose an arrow at it. If you have a bow, lose an arrow, yes. Bonus points uh, for saying lose an arrow as opposed to fire an arrow, which has become one of those modern kind of anachronisms, one might say, because firing is a, is a, is a um, uh, firearms concept. Um, if you have a bow. Otherwise you will have to fight it using your sword, although because of its thick skin your blows will only do it one stamina point of damage. Slugs don't really have thick skin, in fact they don't really have, they hardly have something that qualifies as skin at all, <laughs> really, when you think about it. Uh, because their entire bodies are sort of practically mucous membranes, aren't they? Um, anyway. I am going to just defeat it, and as if by magic, yes, uh, 362, my time-saving uh, spell, which I usually use uh, a lot these days, uh, I think that's the way to go for me. Um, I hope you don't, I mean, I hope you know, my viewers don't mind so much that I don't do the dice rolling. Um, um, just a question for those who have actually watched this far in this particular video. Uh, do you find it exciting to watch me roll the combats? Uh, I don't certainly don't find it very exciting, except on the very few occasions where I've managed to win the battle despite the odds. Um, like against uh, the animal in, um, in Freeway Fighter, for instance. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's, uh, it's been mostly a bit of a bit of a slog. Anyway, the revolting corpse flops down, oozing colorless ichor onto the dusty floor. You may now check the first alcove, the second alcove, or leave the room. So, we have... So, 
first alcove, second alcove, or leave the room. Two, seven, four, leave, 68, alcove, or one, 68, alcove. I presume that um, there's a possibility now that I am being pursued by lizard men. That if I check one alcove, maybe they'll burst in and I won't be able to check the other. I'm going to check the first alcove anyway. Maybe I have time for both. We'll see. The small alcove was obviously used just to store water, wine, or something similar, for there are several smashed pots in it. They are of an interestingly ancient design, but don't appear to hold anything of interest. Poke around for a bit, but nothing comes to light. Now you may investigate the other alcove, or leave the room. So I'll check out the other one, 168. This alcove is disappointing. Holding nothing but piles of wooden trash. Broken and rotten chairs, maybe. You turn to leave and something catches your eye. The glint of lantern light on metal. Peering back into the room, you notice a small crack in the wall. Is there something in there? You squint into the crack. Yes, definitely. Something metallic. Will you reach in and grab it? Investigate the other alcove, if you have not done so already. Or leave the room. So, we've got those options. So I'm going to put the new option here. Grab 188. <clears throat> Little bit sniffly today, um, um, if you can hear that. Um, and it's because... And this is also actually the reason I'm... Ooh, I was doing that and my, actually my ear canal got blocked. Um, uh, this is also partly the reason why I'm playing Gamebook today, because it is raining outside, it is really horrible, and I didn't really feel like going for a walk, but I feel I have earned a little break, because I've practically gone for a walk every single day now since the beginning of March, so that is March, April, May, June, and a little bit of July, so uh, for more than four months now, I've only missed a few days of walking, and... The days I've missed uh, have mostly been because I've been driving all day uh, or otherwise traveling. So um, those are my usual excuses. Today my excuse is that it actually is the rainiest day we've had in ages here. Uh, I've already been outside, gone for a little walk just to, to the shop and back again. Um, but generally I don't really feel like a longer walk today, although I'm... I mean, I'm not bothered by the rain, it's just that I don't enjoy it as much. Um, anyway, 188. And when the weather is damp, as it is today, I seem to get this mucusy thing happening sometimes uh, at the back of my nose where, um, yeah, oh well. Which I haven't had lately, it's been rather dry, mostly. Gritting your teeth to steady your jangling nerves, you reach into the crack. Test your luck. Um, ah, I'm not going to bother rolling for that. Um, I'm going to say I'm lucky. Right, so... Okay, uh, right. <clears throat> Your hand closes on the object and you pull it out. It is a gleaming key that would fit a Z-shaped lock. Hmm, interesting. You slip it into your pocket, praising your good luck and hoping it will come in useful. So, let's just put a note on the map that there here is a oops, z shaped key or for you of the more American persuasion is the Z shaped key in case you wanted um, okay now you may explore the other alcove if you have not done so already uh, okay oh hang on the other alcove is now 
change to paragraph 119. That is indeed interesting. That was not the case before. I'll just double check now. Um, no, it wasn't. Okay. I'm a little bit curious now. I'm just going to check what it says in 119, whether that is something has changed now. Oh. You pull back the remains of the curtain and come face to face with another giant slug. Okay, so there's more of them. I see. Now that's, in, that's interesting, yeah. Okay. Um, and then that leads to 1684. 274, yeah, okay. Um, or leave the room uh, 183, which is now a different paragraph than the one before, interestingly. 183, maybe there's another slug there as well. Pull back the remains of the curtain and come face to face with another giant slug. Okay, so there's a giant slug, regardless of which choice you do there. And then from there you can either go and explore the other alcove or leave. Okay, so there we go. Uh, yeah, I like that way of constructing the uh, location there where you do something that uh, takes a bit of time and then another monster appears and is actually quite streamlined and uh, well done. Yeah, good. Um, 274. Now there's lots of things about this game book that I really like actually the way it's made so I'm quite uh, quite enjoying it. You carefully pull open one of the towering double doors and slip through. <clears throat> A white corridor leads away into the darkness twisted at such an angle that you have great trouble walking along it. Didn't I see that before somewhere? No that was... no... I don't know, it just reminds me of a description of another location I saw last time. Anyway, um, it is also littered with rubble, and the left-hand wall looks very unsafe. The passage turns right after 20 paces or so, and down some well-worn steps. You creep down carefully, managing to avoid the worst rubble. Now you come to a T-junction, where you take the left passage, 312, or the right, 196. And just to double-check, I don't have any... 3-1-12s from before, okay. Um, okay. So I'm gonna, of course, these left and right here, that is for sneaking past the slugs. They will eventually lead to the same place. I'm gonna put my left and right up here, I think. So I'm gonna do it like that. 3-1-12. Uh, no, three, one, two, or oh, one, nine, six, right and left. I'm gonna keep with going right today. Why not? Did left last time. The passage leads only a few paces before opening out into another badly damaged room. Religious relics, pots, robes, and boxes lie smashed across the floor. As you gaze around, though, your eye lights on a chest sitting in a corner, almost completely unscarred. Do you investigate further? Well, yes, well, duh. Um, or would you rather leave this room and move to the other? So, of course I'm going to investigate. Three, three, five. Investigate. <coughs> the chest rattles. And there's something inside it. Examining it closely, notice it has a Z-shaped lock. If you have a key of that shape, turn to 101. If you'd rather try to smash it open, turn to 127. So, we have... Smash... 127... Smash... Or... Uh, 101... Key. And we do have the key. So, we are going to... Open it the proper way. The key fits easily, but requires a lot of forcing to spring the ancient lock. Finally, it gives way with a satisfying click, and the box opens to reveal a massive, gleaming diamond lying on a base of rotting purple pulp. 
You gasp in amazement at its size. It must be worth a fortune. Recovering yourself, you secrete the gem in your rucksack and move on to explore the other room. So, diamond. So that is another of the four gems. This one was hidden with a in a box with a lock that you needed to find the key for. Is that a sign that this one is more special? Also, it was in what seemed to be a sacred place. Maybe this is a sign, this feels, I have a stronger confidence, I think, uh, at finding this one than I did when finding the ruby, that this might be the correct uh, thing, that may be the Eye of Telak. What do you think? Hmm. We'll find out later, probably. Okay, so. Right, one, oh, hang on, three, one, two, yes, um, yeah, okay, well, so the arrow is going the wrong place, it's going down there, three, one, two, okay. After you have gone ten paces or so, the corridor opens out into an almost level floored chamber, only a few paces across. A stone bench is set into the wall on either side of you, and opposite you steps Opposite you, steps lead down into the darkness. Again. You may rest here and eat some provisions. If you wish. Turn to two. At the bottom of the steps, you have arrived in another old and very dusty room. Littered again with small pieces of rubble uh, from its cracked ceiling and walls. In the far corner, what may be a statue or perhaps... A fountain casts grotesque shadows in the lantern light. Do you take one of the dark passages that lead off to the left and to the right, or do you examine the statue or fountain? So, um, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to do left, right, and examine. So two, five, five is left, two, seven, one is right, and three, five is examine. I'm going to examine the statue or fountain. It is a fountain with a small statue of Telak and a statue uh, pouring water into a shallow bowl. The water that trickles out, though, seems very dark. You catch some in your hand and examine it in the light of your lantern. Oh, Talak, it isn't water at all, it's blood. What evil has poisoned this place? You hurry from the room. You may go left or right. Okay, um, maybe this time I'll go left again. I'm missing going left now. A set of crumbling steps leads up to a large door <clears throat> marked with strange arcane symbols. You listen carefully at the door and hear a sound like metal coins being rubbed together. Or metal coins being rubbed together, maybe. You ready your sword, take a deep breath and kick the door. There is a massive thump, but the door remains closed. From inside the room comes a crashing sound. You kick the door again and again, but nothing will budge it. Then, to your horror, the door is flung open with a resounding crash. There, in front of you, is a terrifying sight. Framed in the, do in the doorway stands a warrior king from lost ages past. He has been dead for a, lo a long time, but something has resurrected him and set him to guard this ancient room. He carries a long javelin, poised, ready to thrust at you, and on his head sits a jagged crown studded with emeralds. Okay, so this maybe is where I find the emerald. <coughs> you must fight him. So, we have 10, 11, and that is actually quite a formidable opponent that might not be that easy to defeat. Um, me, on the other hand, of course, uh, since I'm still saving time using my um, fighting fantasy time machine, I have already played this so many times that I've defeated him without losing a single stamina point. Um, 
<coughs> no is getting ready. That's not nice. Okay. As it loses the evil spark that animated it, the ancient body crumples to the floor, shattering into fragments of brown dust. All that is left is a rusting suit of antique armor and a tarnished crown holding two emeralds. You may prize out the gemstones, or perhaps you would rather leave and continue your exploration. <laughs> of course not, because I'm going to prize out the gemstones. Um, so, we have... Seventy six is uh, continue, continue, or two to six emerald. Now, the he did say the eyes plural of Telax, so maybe this is the clue. I was wondering because that would indicate there should be more than one. And the ruby was a single one, the diamond was a single one. And when you get to the point you get to choose, you can only choose one type of gem, which indicates to me that it's probably the one that exists in a set of two. So the emerald is at the moment, or the emeralds is at the moment what seems to be the most likely candidate for being the eyes of Talak. The emeralds flip out of the crown. Rather strangely, both have flat backs, but when you hold them together you see why. They are two halves of the same huge stone. Congratulating yourself on your acquisition, you secrete them in your rucksack and move on. Make a note of your find on your adventure sheet and turn to 78. Not 76, incidentally, which is what you were told before when you leave. Did I write that correctly? I'll just double check now. Uh, no, I did actually write it the wrong way. It is 78. Uh, and there we are. And excuse me a moment. Right, I am back. That was an expected delivery of parcels. Um, I was expecting some interruptions today, so that's fine. Uh, so I decided I am um, definitely am going to 78 to keep going now. All right, so a brass bound door opens to reveal a small passage, which in turn leads to a large room. The chamber is empty of life, but features a row of large stone slabs that look from the deep red... Oh, hang on, that looks very familiar. It could be the same location, just a different paragraph. Let's find out. Um, from the deep red patches splattered on them as if they were used for dissecting bodies or some similarly gruesome activity. Around the walls lie the shards of smashed pots and vases, but most seem to be filled with ashes. Of what you dare not contemplate. Passages lead off straight ahead and to the right. After peering down both, you decide to go right. Why? Why don't I get a choice now? I don't like it when the book makes a choice for me when there is an obvious uh, thing that you could have chosen yourself. I think you should find another kind of way of preventing you from going a certain direction. Anyway, uh, 385 is my next stop. Let's put that up there. 385. The corridor slopes down, but more peculiarly, twists in such a way that it angles sideways as well. This sounds really familiar, isn't this? Um... It sounds identical to, um, to one of the ones I went to last time. I was wondering if this is sort of parallel. Yeah, anyway. Uh, the numbers aren't the same, so at the moment it's it's not clear. Anyway, the corridor slopes down, but more peculiarly twists in such a way that it angles sideways as well. It is very cool and dry down here, but also very musty. Hang on, that is also... Well, hang on. Is that the one? Unless my writing is horrible. One, eight. Let's double check now. One eight. That's one two five. 
Yeah, that's not right. Is that a one, two, five? Three, two, three. I can't read my own writing sometimes. Three, two, three, one, two, five. Hang on. There's something wrong here. It looks like I took a wrong turning last time because at one, two, five, these are not supposed to be the options. Looks like I might have misread something last time. In any case, um, I'm going to ignore that for now, but I'll just put a little mark here just to show that there's something strange going on here. Looks like I may have gone to the wrong paragraph and... Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, I suppose that could happen. Uh, I mean, it would have to happen at some point. Um... Because now I'm at 385. So... Right. So, um, the chamber is quite bizarre, for carved into all the available wall space are small niches, and standing in each niche is a skull in an ornate glass jar. Beneath each skull, a metal plate is affixed to the wall. The skulls of 10,000 beings must be in here, you think, as you gaze in wonder. You peer closer at a niche, only to find that the skulls are not human at all. They are fluted, more as you imagine an elf's skull to look except that they also bear very exaggerated canine teeth. The jars next to each skull contains a nasty surprise for you too, for each holds a small wrinkled grey lump of flesh, etc. So this is the, um, yeah, this is definitely where I was last time, but it is possible I actually took, I went here accidentally last time, possibly, and this, this is the correct path to get here. Um, not a big deal, really. Um, but um, it mainly now means that my map is, is, is a bit off, but there you go. Not a big problem. Now you can't make out what's written on the small metal plates, though there is definitely something there, for the symbols have become faded and illegible over the ages. This room is unsettling, especially for somewhere supposed to be a haven of goodness. Two passages lead out of it, one flight of steps leads up to the left and another flight down to the right. And last time I went uh, down to the end of going. Okay, so if I go to the left. Okay, this is where you start going to the uh, meeting, bumping into the uh, the lizard man. Yeah, so if you go to the right, you end up going to the left, and so you get the same options. Uh, I'll just do going to the right now. So you walk to the top of the stairs and peer down. They seem very steep, and it is very dark down there. Then you draw back hurriedly, for you are sure you heard voices down there. Yes, there they are again. Lizard men. You run for the other steps and leap up them quickly, hearing the clatter of the enemy's boots on the flagstones in the distance behind you. You come to a door, and once you have gone through, it slams shut behind you. In alarm, you notice there is no lock, and gazing around, you realize there is nothing to bar it with either. In blind terror, you race down the corridor, pausing only long enough to notice that it is lined on either side by barred cells, until you reach another door at the far end. You kick, it, kick at it, and it holds firm. It's locked. Your heart sinks. Will you continue trying to force it, or look for a key? So if you look for a key, you find a key. 264. You glance about frantically, the footsteps making you panicky and confused. There is nowhere to hide in here. And then you see it. A large metal ring with a key attached to it, lying half hidden amid some dusty trash a few paces away. You grab it, fumble with the lock, and then it's open. You escape. 
turn to 216. And I really like the pacing and the sort of the frantic, panicky sense you get there. The door flies open and you dart through along another short corridor and to another door. As you reach it, you kick it open, leap into the room beyond and slam the door. You pause for a moment to collect yourself, close your eyes and take a deep breath. <sighs> then you open them. Your feet are getting wet. You gaze around in panic. The room is leaking. Blood-red water is pouring into the room through cracks in the walls and ceiling. Blood-red water? Or Tulak. It is blood. The room is bleeding, which reminds me of some hammer horror film I saw one time. What sort of corrupt evil has infested this place to cause this? As your mind reels, you are distinctly aware of thumps against the door. It flies open, and four lizard men stride in, momentarily confused by the strained angle of the room and its disturbing contents. They quickly recover and leap to the attack. You must fight them two at a time because of the conditions. You must all fight with two deducted from your attack strength, which means it doesn't make any difference if all of you fight with reduced attack strength. Because you're just comparing. It doesn't make any sense to reduce everyone's attack strength. If you defeat the Lizardman, turn to 82. You kick open the door, step through the dark water and trudge up a sloping passageway, leaving wet, squelchy footprints behind you. The passage curves round to the right and then the path forks. You may take the right fork or the left, and last time I took the left, probably. No, I took the, um, yes, the left, not the right. I'm going to go with the left again because I think I have what I need now, so I'll just follow my footsteps until I get back to... Uh, the end of this particular section of the book, so I can see if I can progress further. The corridor curves gently upwards and leads to a small chamber from which stone stairs spiral upwards. A narrow passage leads off to the right. That must be the way to the chapel of Telak. Would you go along the passage or take the stairs? Uh, and in this case, I take the passage, yes. Or should I just sort of try some other choices just to see what else is here and then rather save my game and go back? What do you think? Yeah, I should probably, instead of taking the path I know, maybe I should take uh, one I don't know and see what happens. Yeah, I'll do that. So instead of going left here, I'll just, like I did last time, I'm just going to go right um, and see if there's anything interesting there. Uh, the passageway narrows until it is just wide enough for you to squeeze down. The smooth walls turn rough and you seem to be heading deep into the mountainside. Suddenly the tunnel stops in a small dusty chamber. There is nothing in the chamber and no exits lead from it. Thank to luck you weren't trapped in here by the lizardmen. You shudder and squeeze your way back to the junction to take the other way. So that is just the writer leading you back where you're supposed to be. And then instead of going to the um, straight there, you go to the stairs, 301. I think this might again lead me to the right path, possibly. The staircase spirals on up. Oh, okay. Uh, the staircase spirals, hang on, 301. Yes, yeah, so actually 301 is twice on the map because that is also where you get on the next page here. Um, 395, okay. Okay, so that's actually a shortcut. Uh, to take the stairs, okay. Um, Staircase spirals on up, though thankfully its condition is not too bad. Eventually, after a taxing climb, you reach the top, where your way is barred by another small metal-bound door. You sneak through into a dingy anteroom. Through an archway, you can see into the temple. The last car is standing, his back towards you, as if contemplating the small altar before it. Would you enter and join him, uh, or wait a moment so as not to disturb him and i know of course he got captured by the lizardmen earlier so i'm not going to 
um, or he joined them or whatever last time. Um, you hesitate a moment and your eyes widen as you see a large lizard man march briskly across to Laskar. Maybe Laskar is just actually using you, trying to get these divine artifacts for himself to use them against you. He's actually in all the time he's been in league with the lizard men. That is also a huge possibility. Um... So, um, Laskar talk for a moment, salute, and then march back out of your sight. It is a trap. Do you have the arm of Telak? Still haven't found that. Uh, or not, 77. So I'm going to go to 77. You duck back into the anteroom and cower in the shadows to plan your next move. Suddenly you hear footsteps on the stairs from Telak's temple. The door is flung open and a party of lizard men emerge. You have no chance against them. You struggle as they grab you and drag you into the temple before Laskar, but it's no use. The old man turns with a grin of pure malice on his face. One of the lizard men hands Laskar a bundle wrapped in cloth. He greedily unwraps it to reveal a gorgeous longsword, obviously the arm of Telak. Now, foo, do you have the eyes? demands the old man in a crazed voice. You reach into your pack and retrieve whatever gemstones you found in your travels. If you have no gems, turn to 57. With a disdainful gesture, you scatter them across the floor. And of course, now I actually have three gems to scatter. Laskar dives for them with a mad shout, and you lash out at him. Roll two dice. Uh, skill test. So I'm going to succeed, obviously. Um... Go to 46. You kick catch his Laskar in the jaw, knocking him flying. You grab for the sword in one of the duels. Note down which one you choose on your adventure sheet. You may only choose from those you threw on the floor. So, um, diamonds or diamond or emeralds, of course, are my choices now. And I've had a good feeling about the emeralds. Um, so I'm going to go 228. See what happens. And if that's wrong, I'll try the diamonds. And if that's wrong, then it, it has to be the jets. And I still have to find out where they are. The two gems slot into the hilt perfectly and power courses through your veins. The emerald eyes of Telak gleam with holy energy. Waving the sword above your head, you cry, Telak, be with me. I have the power. And leap for Laskar. Turn to 400. Huh. I was sort of expecting something more to happen before the end of the book. Is this it? Is that is that the end? I'm almost a bit disappointed that that is that, that is the end if if that is the end unless this is a red herring again. Four hundred. The bait cuts deep into the old man, slicing cleanly as the power guides your arm. The traitor dies, gurgling and choking. You step astride his body, the look in your eyes daring anyone to challenge you. The evil lizard men hesitate, unsure of just how much power you now have. You raise your sword aloft, and in confirmation of your powers, the air begins to shimmer, coalescing from nothing. A thousand warriors materialize around you, golden weapons at your ready. The lizard men murmur in terror as the ancient soldiers begin to slice through their ranks. You turn away in disgust, but the sickening slaughter is soon over. Why do you be disgusted by that? You're a soldier. Mm. Uh, with you at the head, the warriors step back into rank. You march away into the west, towards Vimona, the power of your master, Telak Swordbearer, blazing through every atom of your body. With a force like this, charging into battle with the sun behind you, you will free Vimona from the clutches of evil and chaos. The end. Right. Um, I, I, I was really surprised that was the end. I was expecting you having to um, do a little bit more. Go back to... Uh, and also, if you don't find the sword, it gets found for you. It's not clear exactly what happens when you grab the sword there. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was a really well-written book, but I just feel the ending was a bit sort of sudden and, and, and slightly unsatisfactory. It's like, 
didn't feel finished uh, when you get to the end of it. But I must say I still enjoyed it. I enjoy the uh, the um, otherwise the structure of the book, um, the uh, quality of the writing is quite good, uh, and um, yeah, um, it's nice little entry. Uh, so a bit of sort of overground stuff and a bit, but it felt it felt a little bit too easy because that means that I almost made it. Um, if I just made a sort of one or two small choices, different one choice really, I could have won it on my first try, which is something I don't really like being able to because that means you inevitably miss out on some parts of the book that might add sort of flavor and interest. And uh, I don't want to win these books too easily um, and also not too hard sometimes. It depends on the book. If a book is really well written and enjoyable, Creature of Havoc, um, it's fine to be playing it over and over and of course actually enjoying every bit of wrong step as much as you enjoy the right steps. So that means my friends that um next time in my next episodes i will be playing slaves of the abyss the one with this one of the ones with the slightly quirky covers there is this a science fiction story looks like there's a lot of space behind it um what does it say calamere lies defenseless the army is away invasion from the north etc etc i know that sounds like a kind of a fantasy uh one again even though the cover looks a bit uh yeah anyway i'll find out when i start playing that next time so um thank you very very much for watching uh, i hope you enjoyed this and uh do what you do to support my channel you know what to do there's there's links, there's your usual YouTube interaction, there's the one that is often overlooked by the way, which I might as well mention, is if you add any of my videos to public playlists that actually gives them more prominence on YouTube and YouTube searches, so that's a thing that uh, you can also do. Um, yeah. And also, if you appreciate the fact that my videos don't have adverts on them, of course, you also know what to do. Uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in my next one. So I'll probably make some non-fighting fantasy videos before I make more fighting fantasy videos now, but there will be more coming up at some point. So thank you for watching, and goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Oh.